Okay, hi guys. Sorry, I'll uh, maybe I start now. Hi, uh, my name is Michael. I am. Uh, if you don't know me yet, it's fine. I'm not that important. Uh, my name is Michael. Um, you can find my slides online. Oh, it's still frozen. Okay, sorry. So, uh, my name is Michael. Uh, you can find me on these places, on Twitter, on uh, on GitHub. You can also find me on my website, www.kodokungfu.com yeah. uh, So that's us um, You can also get the slides, you need to get the slides They, they are on uh, speaker deck So j.mp slash php agile toolbox right? um, The videos, are, I'm recording the videos now The, the videos for all, for all the talks for today will eventually end up on this website right? so you need to if you have a picture of this, go ahead. Yeah. You can bug me. Don't bug me too often, I hope. <laughs> yeah, you can find me on Facebook uh, if you can find me. <laughs> okay, um, right, so my talk is about an Agile uh, toolbox for a PhD developer. So basically, what is an Agile developer? Uh, the, soft, soft, the, soft, the Agile Manifesto describes the software craftsman as one who is who, who who feels that interaction and, and uh, individuals and interactions are more important than processes. Uh, someone who uh, believes in delivering working software more than being having comprehensive documentation. How many of you have worked at uh, projects where you are to write so much documentation, but at the end of the day, your software is still not working? <laughs> kind of interesting, isn't it? So we, we, we we cherish, uh, we think that working software is more important than having lots of documentation. We feel that customer collaboration is more important than negotiating over the contract because we want to build something that the customer feels is important, that the customer feels that is, that is uh, really what we need. Um, and an agile developer also responds to change rather than following the plan because things can happen in the midst of, the, of developing a project. Right, so the project that you worked on, a web project or a software project, can take about a year or, or less or more. Um, so being able to respond quickly to changes is more important. So being able to do that is very important for the client. And that's why the agile uh, methodology of building software is, you know, right, is pretty relevant in, in this respect, as in being able to respond quickly to changes. Um, so an agile developer needs to have tools and processes in place that can help them Get this, get this thing done. So, be, so an agile developer is also communicative and collaborative. Basically, we discuss and talk to, their, to talk to people and the, 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 the stakeholders in, in that project you're working on. So you, you, you have discussions over stories. What are important for to deliver that, that feature, right? So basically, you want to have tools that help you communicate better and collaborate better with your with the co-workers and with the stakeholders. Having test driven and behavior driven development is also important uh, because you, what we want to do is to not build buggy software. <laughs> Although uh, tests are not a silver bullet, tests still fail. I mean, a bug is just uh, a test that you're not written yet. <laughs> right? So, having test driven development and, uh, is helpful and it also helps you keep your sanity because you have to keep going in. Is this code working? Is this code working? When you have code, test the code that is working, then you are safe. So, so they say. Um, being responsive to change, basically, it's not waiting till the end of the de development life cycle to fix a bug. Sometimes, in the middle of working on a project or working on a story, feature story, you find there's a bug elsewhere, right? So you either fix that together as part because that is a blocker for your story, or you. See Hive it off as a separate story or a bug story. But being able to respond quickly and find bugs and tell people about the bugs is important. And being able to solve it eventually would be a good thing. Um, it helps also your stakeholders and business owners in prioritizing what needs to be worked on. So it, essentially, being agile means being able to communicate effectively. Uh, it's not just being you alone in your own computer working on stuff. 
That's why the hackathon I'm today with people working in the team because we want people to collaborate, to work together, mm -hmm. think together. Uh, or rather, you know, think together more like let's let's have a um, collaborative collaborative effort in doing things that matter. Um, we can attend members. So one one famous man once said. So the two <coughs> the two box. So basically, the, uh, although the two box. I'm talking about for PHP developers, but not all the tools are written in PHP because we're using the best tool for the job, right? We're not just blindly following and using must be PHP. Doesn't work that way, right? In real life, doesn't work that way. Um, so we take, we find the best tools that we, we think is, is, is suitable for the job, uh, given our, our knowledge. And I'll be sharing with you my knowledge of what I think are the best tools that are available right now as a, for a developer. So I've, I've, I've broadly categorized the tools into a bunch of them uh, over here. Writing tools, collaboration, collaboration tools, productivity tools. Productivity as in helping you write code faster, more effectively, right? Uh, testing tools, what are the tools you can use to help you test your code? And also deployment tools, what are the tools you can use to deploy your code quickly from your desktop, development environment into the production environment? Okay, I think I made a mistake here. How, show of hands, how many of you are actually developers? write code on a daily basis. Okay, uh, students who are studying to be something. I don't know, students. Okay, great. Uh, business owners. Okay, right. So you are the ideas people, we need you. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of you are? Categories, please. Okay, never mind. <laughs> I hope you gain something out of this because if you're, pursue, you're thinking of pursuing a career as a as a developer as an engineer, I hope you find some of the ideas I share with you will be important. If you are going to be a manager, that will be managing a team of developers. I hope this will also be uh, this knowledge will also will also be effective uh, for you as a resource, as a go-to place for information on how to help better manage a team. So, hope this will help you. So writing tools, basically what we want to use is an IDE. People in the past has used um, a text editor. I've seen people build entire websites using just Windows Notepad. It is possible, but don't do it. <laughs> Please, don't do it. That's crazy talk, right? So um, nowadays we use things like uh, a full, what, uh, IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. So what it means by integrated means everything is in one place. In one window, you can write your code, you can, you can jump quickly from one code to another, one, one file to another file just by holding the control click or, or command click on the, on the, on the line and jump straight to the next file, right? That is very effective and very fast, right? So it helps you work quickly on your code. Basically, uh, when you're writing a, a software, usually it's not just about opening one file and writing entire software in one file. Usually we break it down into smaller files and smaller bits being able to navigate very quickly between these files is very important. Uh, personally, I'm a big, big fan of Vim. Uh, Vim, as you, some of you might know, is, is a text editor only found in the terminal. So people who are on terminal or console or whichever it's called. So this is very effective. You log into a Linux machine or a, book, uh, like a, soft, uh, a server that you spin up on soft layer, you'll be able to get in and look at stuff. But to edit stuff, you need some text editor that can function properly in the terminal. So you probably use something called Vim, right? Uh, but if you're on your on your Mac or on your Windows machine, you probably want to use something more, more powerful or with a lot of GUI, with a good graphic user interfaces. So you just kind of drag and drop, put stuff around. So PHP Storm is a very effective tool um, that you can use. It's uh, not free, unfortunately. Uh, Vim is free, yeah. So, uh, PHP Storm is not free, you know, but there's, I think it's a 40% discount right now uh, if you go and buy it on their website, I think. So, something free you can look at is things like NetBeans. NetBeans is from, uh, for PHP is, is free. So you can open it's Basically, it's, it's, it's very easy to differentiate. It's, on the left hand side, there's a project uh, window where you have all your files, and on the right is the, the file you're working on. So, it's basically that. Um, one tool that's been gaining some uh, popularity nowadays is uh, something called Atom. Atom is developed by GitHub, so it's very it's a nice text editor. Um, there's another text editor called Sublime Text, which some of your, uh, your developers might be using as well. 
So it's all, the nice thing about IDE is that it color codes everything. So it's like you see everything in black and white, it's very boring, right? And you're very hard, very easy is to find, very easy to miss out on, on, on mistakes. Um, color coding of the file that you're working on helps you identify errors very quickly. And IDE, for example, like PHP Storm will actually add a squiggly, squiggly line underneath. There's a syntax error, like you write something wrongly, you're left out of the semicolon at the back. So the IDE helps you write less buggy code, right? So having, and also having software that has everything in one window makes it very easy to do. You don't have to context switch. We in, as a developer, you want to be effective, and right? As, uh, really productive. And the, one of the biggest problem that a developer faces is context switching. Context switching means moving from one context to another context. Basically, you're looking at code, looking at the web page, looking at the code, opening the, or logging into the server, looking at the code, looking at the documentation, looking at the code, reading your API file. So it's like, all these things is very uh, mentally taxing, right? So as a developer, you want to be effective. You want to make sure, you want to make sure your development environment is conducive to, to help you be, be productive. And having ID, uh, for example, PHP Storm, there's a shortcut key that can be pressed to show you the, doc the documentation that's meant for this function that helps you in uh, finding out, okay, I, I, as a developer, right, I, I know what function is available, but sometimes I do not remember all the, all the, all the arguments that can pass in. So having documentation that, help aut that auto completes and helps you and hints to you what could be, if, what are the valid arguments, it's very good. It's very handy. So, uh, or rather it helps you be very quickly. So you, you, you see, the, when you're using IDE, sometimes the most often used key on the keyboard is the tab. So because it auto completes the entire sentence for you, it's like a very long method name. You, you just type the first five characters, it, it suggests to you the complete function name. You just press tap, boom, the entire method is there. Right? So which is very good. So we're using something like PHP Storm on that means it has all that built in. A Vim that requires a bit of massaging and adding a plugin, but it can be done. Right? Atom as well, there's a, there's a whole ecosystem of plugins that you can use, you can download online and get it gets working. RTFM, read the friendly manual because we are developers and we are not uh, in an encyclopedia because our brain power is only so limited. So what we do is we always go to the website for, for, for reference. Personally, I always, if I'm writing PHP code, I always go to PHP site, the php.net website documentation for all the, all the, what are the valid arguments I can pass in this method, right? So sometimes I cannot remember, so I just go to the website. Although I can auto hint, on IDEs, but sometimes going to the to the documentation on the website is also very good. If you look at the PHP uh, .net website, the PHP .net website is although there's there's documentation, there's also uh, quotes and suggestions that people put in. Right, for example, you're looking for like, like a search for. Um, JSON and code. Okay, JSON and code methods here. Great. Go in there. I can find the methods, I, the arguments I'm looking for, what I need to put in to make this function work properly. If I scroll further down, you see a bunch of sample codes which are very good at. I've, I cannot underestimate how many times I've copied and pasted code from here. <laughs> right? Uh, and you scroll even further down, you'll find people commenting about things. They say, oh yeah, user contributed notes. So sometimes people talk about, oh yeah, this piece of code doesn't work in PHP 4, but I have a fix. And it suggests, and it suggests a, a way uh, for fixing this problem. Um, so user contributed notes are actually very good uh, in helping you uh, solve problems and find, find solutions to, to, to the problems that you're facing right now. Another tool that I use is called Dash. Dash is, uh, is, is a nice tool that can use. I see where I can bring it up. Dash. Right, so the Dash uh, looks something like this. So we're looking for PHP. PHP. Oops. Uh, let's say I look for the PHP documentation. And from here, I do JSON and code. Right, this is what we're looking for. Previously. So this is an offline documentation. So if you're out in, in an Ulu island like Pulau Ubin uh, where there's no internet connection or something, you want something that can, you know, uh, you can read offline. 
Uh, there's, a, there's a trend going on right now uh, in the Rails community and the J JavaScript community. They call this, they call it camping. They go camping. They really go camping. They really go to the wilderness where there's no internet connection. Uh, Rails camp and JS camp, they really go out into the wild and there's no internet connection. And, there's, and they talk tech in those places. Very weird, but they do it. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no internet connection. So, it's, so at that point, you're, you're, like, you're just left with your knowledge of what you actually know. And maybe some code that you've checked out before, right? So having a tool like Dash actually is very helpful. You need to do quickly re refer reference something that you need. Although most ID, most uh, languages nowadays actually have a console or some uh, ter terminal-based thing to just ask for help. What is this? Uh, what are the methods or arguments which, uh, available for this? I think PHP should have. And I haven't tried it. I haven't tried it well. But in the Ruby community, they have it. So in the Ruby. I already you can ask like what is, are the methods, what are the methods available with this guy and yeah. So so look at so always go to the website if you're if you're in doubt. Uh, and if you need something offline, there's a something something cool to use. Dash is not free though. Uh, so you might want to think about it. There's I think in go to the phd.net website you can actually download the entire uh, uh, documentation into a CHM or like Windows help file, you can just look, look through or you can HTML uh, version of the entire PHP.net documentation site in there. Very good. Right, collaboration tools. Sometimes you need to, developers nowadays don't work in a silo, they work in a team. They work with people around them, people that they call their friends and people they call their enemies and they work with people that they don't really like but they still have to work with. Uh, and people that they really do like and somehow they can't work with. <laughs> anyway, that's Right, so um, collaboration tools, how you share code and work with another an, an developer. One way to do that is to use something called a version control system. In Back in the olden days of the dot-com era, they have something called CVS and uh, SVN, which is subversion. But nowadays, the cool kids use Git. <laughs> okay, I'm not that cool. But still. Yeah. So uh, 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 most agile developers nowadays use Git. Um, at one time, I used something else called Dax, but that's a different uh, story. <laughs> so Git is very nice too. It's developed by the same guy who wrote Linux, uh, Linux the Linux kernel. So uh, uh, Linus Pobos, he wrote. Uh, he, he was basically Linus got frustrated with the conversion control system he was working. They were working with uh, being an open source software uh, that that Linux is, but the project is using a a, a, a proprietary version control system. He got really pissed off with it because there was some merge conflict that you couldn't solve properly or something or other. And so he basically went out and wrote his own version control system. So it became Git. Yeah. Git is available on Windows, it's available on Linux, it's available on OS X and maybe some other obscure systems you may have heard of. You know, like FreeBSD or something. Anyway, so you can find it uh, very easily. It's a command line tool. You can, you, people who are, are comfortable with the terminal will find this very a joy to work with. And there are plugins you can install as well. And there are things they can do like um, put in there a free, you can create hooks. Like for example, if something is wrong with the server, you cannot push it. So you will actually tell you that as well. So yeah. Um, but if you're not, if you find the command line a, a scary place, it's okay. It's fine. GUI, is a, there are GUI tools available for you. So you can check out source tree. Source 3 is a Mac app, so you can download that and then look at the code in, in the comfort of the Mac Windows app, uh, app right? So in Windows, there are also uh, similar software available, so you can find one as well. But uh, place the host your, your Git repository. Once you, so basically, a, Git, a, a version control system means I one guy checking the file, and then the other guy can then uh, download the file. If the other if he has a file that's, that's been, if both are working on the same file, uh, this version control system will help you find out where the conflicts are and maybe help and then you can use the software to help you resolve conflicts. Right. Like say, oh this guy's over overwritten line of five, but I need line of five, let's bring it back. You can do that. Right. Something like that. So sometimes you, you can host this in a in a, in a very nice place. And GitHub is a, is a is a website where you can host your Git repositories freely. Right? And there's another one called Bitbucket, it's both are free. But if you want to host something private, like you have your own uh, client projects and you don't want other people to, to know about, you can try using this bucket. This bucket uh, provides for private private repositories, 
So basically, only you people that you want to trust and log in and use it, right? So they can, they can do that. Uh, for GitHub, you have to pay a little bit to get private repos, but it's actually quite worth it if you're working in a big team, right? Uh, so GitHub and Git Bitbucket are both available. But if you want something in-house, as in you want to have a Git server hosted in within your network for security reasons, you cannot host, like you're working on a finance app or a banking app, they cannot host this on a third-party website because GitHub and Bitbucket are actually uh, on servers in America. So you have some anti-American sentiments there, you don't want to host it there, it's fine, it's fine, it's okay, you can just download an open source project called GitLab, which you can install and then in, your, in your own network and then host, it, host your own Git server. It's very cool. Uh, GitLab is written in Ruby and it runs some software, uh, the server software called Passenger and has its own entire stack of Git services they can use, so it's pretty cool. So think of GitLab is like um, uh, GitHub, but the open, but, but open source version and can propose it house. The user interface is quite nice, so yeah. Uh, now that you have your version control system, spanking new system, you gotta find a way to uh, agree among your developers on how to work, how to work together. So there are a couple of ways that they can work together. You can, just, you can always just keep push the, uh, and pull everything from one repository that everyone works, works from. Okay, use uh, what we call what we call Git flow. Git flow means to create different branches. Each branch have a different purpose. So you have so each developer have a development branch that you work off, uh, and then there's a production branch that actually gets released. To. So branches are, are like uh, a copy of your code but split up. Then you can work on it separately. After you're done, you can put, I can merge it back into the main thing, right? So a branching strategy means you can create different branches. One for hot fixes, one for production and one for um, development work and one for feature. So all, and all your developers work on off the feature branch. When you're ready, you, re you merge it into the development branch. The development branch then gets tested, checked by QA, and then when it's ready, it's merged into the production branch, and then what you release to production is what is in the production branch. Sometimes the hot fixes, hot fixes are like, oh yeah, it's released to production already, but we have a bug that we need to fix very urgently. So you create a hotfix branch, you do quick, quick fixes, you merge it back into master, into master production, and it goes to production, right? So <coughs> that's one strategy. Uh, but on a small project, you might not want to do that because you have a small team, two or three guys, it goes, it's just too much of a hassle. So Gitflow is only effective if you have a mature project which you're working with, and you're working with a team of like 10 to 15 people, each of them working on different branches. Git flow might be a good strategy to work off. Another way is you work off is uh, what we call a forking workflow. A forking workflow means each, each developer creates your own fork. You basically fork a uh, from the main master. You create a you create another uh, repository that you serve. They only serves you. You yourself get, has has push rights to this other repository. And basically, when you are ready with your changes, you do what we call a pull request. You take your code changes and make a request to the main branch and say, oh, I got changes, uh, maybe five files, right? And what we do, things like on GitHub and on GitLab, there's, uh, there are tools that support this. You can create pull requests and you can see in a very nice web page, like the differences, the, di the diff, which a diff is basically in one, sh one sheet, it shows you what was added and what was removed, right? A diff is a very usual way of seeing what, are, what were the lines that were added and removed. And from this diff, you can have a good gauge of whether what you're adding is going to break or not break the code, right? So once you see the diff, which usually is a web page, you see a web page um, and you find that the changes made are okay, you, you can then do a uh, merge. You can merge this pull request into the main branch and then you can effectively distribute it or, or push it into production, right? So, that's another workflow. So there are different ways of doing this. There's a website you can go to. You can check out uh, the website the comparing workflows. There are a couple of workflows that Google has, smart people has come up with. Right? Uh, I didn't invent any of these workflows, but people smarter than me. Yes, there are people smarter than me <laughs> who has invented these things. Right? So um, yeah, I would suggest you go check it out and find the best one that, work, that fits for your team. Right? Another productivity tool is use a bloody framework. Please use the framework. I have friends who, 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 who 
who, who do, simply refuse to use a framework and simply <coughs> want to just write his own code. Right? Um, I would throw expletive at him, but then it won't change him. So I'll just let him be. But anyway, if you have the power to do this, use a framework. If you have to write your own framework, go ahead and write your own framework. Any framework will do. Uh, when I first started out as a PHP developer, I unknowingly wrote my own framework because I have felt the pain of writing code from scratch over and over again. So because I don't want to repeat, keep repeating myself, I went about and wrote something, which eventually I, I found out was called an MVC pattern. I went and wrote something, I didn't know what it was. I just intuitively feel that it was the right thing to do. Okay, just disclaimer, I don't have a computer science degree. So, uh, so, <laughs> so I went and wrote the framework and I realized, oh, that is, it's called MVC framework. So anyway, uh, M MVC framework means stands for model view controller. Basically, it basically takes your your website. Uh, you have the view, which is the HTML, what you generate eventually and show on the web page. The model, which basically is a is a code in code representation of what you have in the database. The database, they have users, the database, you have shopping cart, products and whatnot. So a model kind of represents that, and the controller is kind of like the glue, right? The glue, the glue that, that, that that puts these two together. So you go to the URL, say, slash user, slash one, which, which the controller will know, or oh, you're looking for the user controller. The user controller, you're passing the number one. So I'm, I'll query the database, look for the user with the ID the one, and bring it out, and then generate all this properly in a nice HTML page that you can see. So an uh, NVC framework like Laravel and KPHP are very effective in helping you write code quickly. Uh, what's good about using a framework? Well, one advantage of using a framework is that you probably can find other, other developers who have written stuff in this framework and it makes it easy to hire people <laughs> who has written stuff in this framework. Or maybe what you need to do is find some, uh, a decent PHP developer, pass him the manual for, or rather the, uh, pass him the URL link for the website like royalbell.com or php.org, uh, kphp.org, and you can read up and you ruin half an hour to a day. Um, you can effectively look at your source code and say, oh, this is what was the problem. Ah, I can, I know what, how to create a new uh, uh, model for this. So it makes it easier for your team members to, new team members especially, to ramp up, right? So you are using a framework which is generally quite well used in the market. It's, it's, it makes it easier for you to hire people who can then come on board very quickly and get, be productive very quickly, right? So that's important. Even, especially in a hackathon like this, you want to be able to rapidly build an application, to build something quickly, and not like, oh, let's write this from scratch. I can do this in Notepad. Ignore that guy, right? So, so just go for the guy who, who knows how to write, use, write things in the framework, take PHP. Of course, if you are genius, you have already a bunch of code written somewhere, okay, you can just pull out or get, get pull from somewhere. It's fine, go ahead and do it, right? it's fine. But, but for, the, for normal folks like us, we, we like to use framework. And also, not just use a framework, but use a framework that supports testing because not all frameworks are equal. There are some frameworks that are makes it easier for you to do testing. Uh, there are other frameworks that just don't care about testing. There's this particular framework I've seen that is only written in 42 lines of code. It's called Nano, I think. I can't remember what it's called. It's called Nano or Pico or something. So, <laughs> 42 lines of code, no test, but it, it's readable. You can look at a, you look at a freaking code, you know what's going on. So. But for frameworks like this, usually they're bigger and, and yeah, you need proper tests. <coughs> One thing, other thing, important you do is that um, as a developer, you try not to reinvent the wheel. As a developer, you try not to reinvent the wheel. So what we do as in doing in, in not reinventing the wheel is finding smarter people out there who has already solved the problems that you are facing, right? So when Google online, probably someone, oh, I have this, I have this problem. Oh, I have solved the problem. You go Stack Overflow, you find a whole bunch of these guys. So when you do that, um, they try to find a way to share their code, right? So somebody smart out there has to solve a problem, you want to share it with the whole world because that's what the open source is about, right? You, you want to share your knowledge about how to solve problems. Um, and solving real world problems is a very important thing that everyone should try to do. So people, as smart people as written code, they want to share it. The way they share it is using um, stuff like Composer. Composer is a, a package dependencies system for PHP. So basically you take your code, you you package it in a certain way, in a certain folder structure, you name your files in a certain way, and when you use Node uh, or when you use a composer, you would understand how to uh, how to use the code 
and how do you, how then you can effectively use the code in your project, right? So Composer is something that is, uh, is created for PHP. So it's as simple as, I'll show you some example later. Uh, in the, if you're doing front-end development like in uh, on, on a JavaScript stuff, there's NPM, which you can use for, uh, NPM stands for Net Node Package Manager, it's from Node.js. Uh, and for Browserify and Bower, these are uh, package managers you can use. So what is do is that smart people has written some code, you want to share with the world, they, 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 they structure their project, their code in a certain way, and they share it and put it on some GitHub or something, and then you have a there's a directory listing where you, all these smart people's shared codes are, are listed. So then you can pick and choose the stuff that you need and use it. Usually you have a file that declares what you need, uh, which package, which, which exact package uh, that you need from all these smart people. And then you can you download all that and you can then use it. In the uh, Ruby world, there's something called Bundler. Uh, I think Bundler is kind of like the gold standard for package managers. Uh, some people would probably fail me for that, but it's, uh, so in the PHP world, we have Composer. In the, in the JS world, we have an NPM, Browserify, and Bower. Um, Bower is very interesting. Bower, you have to install Bower using Node NPM. So basically, it's like uh, you use a package manager to install another package manager, which is... <laughs> Did I get the joke? <laughs> anyway, uh, with Composer, basically, you pick and choose libraries that you like. Uh, you basically find them all on packages.org. Right? So this is a website that uh, the smart people around PHP has put together. So the packages, uh, packages are all is a site where you can go to and then you can download. You can do a, a nice search. There's a project that I work uh, that I've created. It's called PHP Q. Yeah. So that's my project. So you can download two thousand seven hundred and seven times. Awesome. So. This, you can find people's uh, nice projects that they've written and then you can use this. To use it is very, very easy. So usually what we do is we create a file for uh, a, a text file. A text file is uh, usually in a JSON format. JSON, JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation, which you don't have to remember, just know it's called JSON. JSON is data. Data is so awesome source. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you compose your own a composer of J J JSON and you put in it like a bunch of uh, code that will say I want this project, I want this project in my, in, in my, I want this third party project in my uh, library, in my uh, project. So this is an example how it looks like. So require, is a section that says I, I require this too. I require respect rest, I respect some, I require something called monologue. Monologue is like a logging tool. Uh, respect rest is a rest API uh, server which you can download uh, which you can use to serve uh, API data. Like say on your phone, you want to use data you, uh, that you get from the database. You, do, you don't need to make an SQL query call to the database. You can just see, uh, uh, you can just expose it as the REST API. It's all very uh, heavy jargon, so you can call it Google it later, but yeah, it's, it's, just know it's awesome source. Um, for managing uh, stuff in the database, we use this thing called PHP Active Record. I personally like this project, uh, PHP Active Record. So it's kind of like uh, object uh, object relational mapping. So it's kind of nice. So instead of opening, uh, getting, uh, writing SQL queries, you just write uh, code and say find all, like user dot find all, and you basically find all the users for you. This, that is a that's a design pattern called Active Record. So, yeah, so it's kind of nice. So basically, with a text code, text file like this, you run a you run the composer uh, a binary. So you just download. You just go to the website. You tell me where where to download the file. Download that. Run composer install. You basically go online to all the git repositories like you want, like respect rest, monolog. You can go a good do a git pull or download a zip file that has a that has a project you need, and you then find all this nicely packaged into one folder called the vendor folder. B and B -R. So everything is inside there. So all you need to do is include a new file, uh, I think it's called autoload.php from inside the vendor folder. And you just declare, I want to use monolog and immediately you can use it already. So it's so awesome. Yeah. So uh, before before there was even something called Composer, we had to go, go to every single uh, mother son's website and just do a git pull or download the zip file or whatever. So, and then you got manages manually and all that. It's a, it's a dependency nightmare. 
So if some verse like what you see in the, in this uh, file is that you can also declare which version you need, right? So like say a particular project has a bug fix, or they have a version bump that gives it new features. Uh, in the past, what we had to do is they go to the website, download the zip file, unzip it, copy and paste into your into your project, and pray to God it doesn't break anything. <laughs> right. Whereas nowadays, they, you can easily just open this file, change change up the number a little bit, uh, and you basically download the right thing for you. Uh, and these guys use uh, follow a, a thing called semantic name, uh, semantic versioning, semver. Semantic versioning means in the three digits here. Uh, the last digit means uh, it's just a minor fix. It's just we will not break any compatibility. Uh, minor fixes to the to the to this uh, to this um, project. Uh, second one is minor. The second one will also be there will be additional features that you add, additional features, and if, if you bump the first number, usually there's backward compatibility breakage. They need to do things that will break very badly. You will update the, the first digit, right? So, so be very careful when updating the first digit. So. Semantic versioning is something you should take note of. Right? And as developers, if you're working on your own project, uh, you should also take note of something like this. This is good habit. Hygiene. Yeah. So you run Composer install, you run something like this. You see all the projects, uh, all the projects, all the libraries that you need, like Monolog, Respect Rest, all they will be packaged together into protocol vendors. You can then open this up and look through and then see how it looks like. You can edit the files you need to. It's kind of nice. Other other dependency ma managers like um, Bundler actually installs the library uh, globally, as in your entire system will have this this uh, this file. Whereas with Composer, it just loads it into a folder for you, so you can then play with it. Uh, other productivity tools you can quickly spin up our PHP server. As of PHP 5.4, there's a built-in uh, web server in PHP. So you just type PHP <coughs> dash s with capital S localhost. 8000, you will basically load up into your uh, your your current directory will be immediately serve as a web server. Pretty cool, eh? In the past, you got to install Apache and all that other stuff, which is a pain in the ass. Oops, uh, yeah, yeah. So, yes, PH, uh, this is pretty cool. Good for testing, but not for production, okay? But it does, don't use this in production. You get stalked by me if you use this in production, okay? Uh, of course, there's another project out there called PHP Up, which is kind of nice. You, you, will be, you load it into Linux or, or, or a Mac OS machine. You basically uh, just type PHP Up, you, you will start up Apache and serve your current folder in Apache, which is kind of nice as well. Um, because on Linux and on, on Mac, there's already Apache is already pre installed, so it's kind of nice. So, to run the build in PHP web server, is pretty simple. Just type PHP dash s. Uh, the IP address usually is the 0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.0, which is any IP. Then followed by a port number. Um, usually the port 8000. You have to be root to do this, so usually you have to be sudo. Actually, you may not have to be, I can't remember. Yeah, I can try it. Yeah, I can just try it. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, this thing is only from PHP 5.4 onwards, okay? So try not to do this in PHP 5.2. Or if you're using PHP 4, please upgrade your PHP. Do not use PHP 4 anymore. Okay. Uh, other productivity tools. Sometimes writing all web server is nice. Having to be able to write uh, to check your own code, the PHP code is nice. But sometimes you want something a bit more comprehensive. To do that, we use something what we call a virtual environment, which means from our machine we can emulate and create a we can speed up an emulated version of what we will be like in production. Chances are if you're loading, if you're using PHP, you will probably be running a Linux server, uh, either an, a Ubuntu, Debian, or CentOS machine on the web hosting site, right? So you drill on web hosting servers. Usually they are, it's a Linux server. And you yourself are working, is working on a Mac or working on a Windows machine, which kind of like, there's a disconnect there. You're not working in an environment which is close to production, you're kind of like simulating that or you, you're playing cheap by installing tools that look like it's on production, but it's not. So, <coughs> what we sometimes do is we separate on a, a, a virtual environment. The virtual environment basically we uh, virtual machine, we spin up a, like, uh, a, a version of, of Linux, like CentOS or Ubuntu running on your machine with a different IP address that you yourself can access to. 
and with this you can install all the stuff that you need for production to make it look like production right? so this is very cool so one tool that makes it very easy for you to do this is something called Vagrant you can go to vagrantup.com so you can, you can use but you need to install a few other things uh. it's not as simple uh, but it's, it's one tool that helps you manage those things you need to install VirtualBox VirtualBox is a very nice um, it's a free, free tool uh, so let's see what VirtualBox. VirtualBox is um, so it's a free software you can download and basically you with it you can install uh, uh, Linux and make it run in your machine. Although it also shares your CPU and shares your RAM, uh, so yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So Vagrant is uh, kind of like Vagrant up. Uh, Vagrant is a, a command line tool that helps you manage these virtual machines. And another good thing about uh, Vagrant is it also provides pre-packaged uh, operating systems you can download, uh, like say on Vagrant up Ubuntu, you basically go and download the, uh, Ubuntu from some website and download for you. But sometimes I use this one called Vagrant Boxes. Vagrant Boxes, so you can use this as a way of downloading tools. Um, downloading and some so some people some smart people has put together different versions of of, of the operating systems you can then download um, into your things into your into your, into your machine. So you try that. And if you're scared about doing this yourself, there's also a very nice tool. Uh, some somebody has also put together a, a very nice tool called. Um, okay. Yeah, so there's a uh, there's online too, which you can then download and uh, yeah. So basically, it's, it's an online wizard called Puppet. So with this, you can just go through the wizard and you download a zip file which contains all the configuration you need to start a to spin up a website. I can show you. I hope I can show you very quickly how it is like. Something like this. Uh, I can just type Vagrant up, uh, which will then start the box. So this this is something I did last night. So yeah, uh, I went through that configuration file. So the configuration is very straightforward. Just go in and say I want I'm using it in virtual box. I can even load it up onto Rack Space, you know, or soft layer or whatever services that you need. It's kind of cool. Right. So you have instructions on how to do that. It's kind of nice. So there's all these instructions on which port you want to open, what firewall rules, what web server you want, you can you choose Nginx or Apache based on what your production server will have. We install the databases for you. We install additional tools like some uh, database management tools and kind of everything you need uh, as a modern web developer. So once it's done, this is all you see. You probably you would see that. Hang on, let me just try to resize this. Right, so from up here, I can basically say, oh, okay, Vagrant SSH. And now I am logging into the virtual box. And you can see here, this this is, um, yeah, I have Apache 2 here. So this is, you're logging into an Apache or you Ubuntu box in your local in your local machine. So you have, which kind of nice. <coughs> so with this, you can basically run and simulate the production environment on your local machine. And what you can, what the best part is that this configuration can also be shared with your coworkers. So any other developers in your team, you can also have the same configuration, and you can chances are they will have the same environment. So anyone coming to your team, oh, I'm a PHP developer, I'm doing, I'm joining a company, I don't know anything about setting up a server. How do I get started? So you just pass it this file, that big up, boom! Ah, oh, I have a, I have a PHP environment. I can start with coding in PHP in less than one day. So awesome. Yeah, which is true, I mean, I'm not joking, it's really true. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so remember that, Puppet is a good place to go. Uh, other productivity tools. Um, try not to be scared about Terminal. Terminal is not a scary place, it's just text. You, uh, how many Mac users do we have here? Mac users? Uh, Windows users, uh, Linux users, you alien people. <laughs> anyway, um, for Mac users, there's a very nice tool called Item 2. 
which is kind of, I think, a really like uh, terminal on steroids. <laughs> it's a bad description. Anyway. Yeah, so ter terminal is a very good thing you need to have. So you have with terminal, you can do uh, file management, you can log into remote servers, you can, you can manage other remote uh, servers and all that stuff. So it's kind of nice. Um, there's a very nice tool as well called Tmux. Tmux is kind of like, um, think of it as tab browsing on, on, on terminal. So you can do very nice, very fun things like, uh, you know, this, this uh, let's just create a new session here. So this session, I can then start like a Tmux, yes. So I have a Tmux session, I'm working on file, on, on, I'm working on some file here, I can do, I'm going to speed this up, you know, I can then do it, not split, you know, and then I can open my bin here, oh sorry, I can open bin here, you know, and yeah, so I can look at my codes here if I need to, you know, and I can go down here and like, I can do a ping to uh, google.com, you know, so, so I can navigate all these windows using my keyboard, I can just press control, uh, control J, K, L, HJKL, I can move all over the place, you know, kind of thing. So, yeah, so it's kind of, it's kind of like tap browsing uh, on, on terminal. It's kind of nice. And if you want, you can even create new windows so you can navigate back, you know, you know so I can do other stuff here. And, uh, so, yeah, so it's kind of, it's kind of nice. It's, it, it make, so basically, as I, I discovered as a, as, a, as a developer, I really want to not use my mouse at all. You want your hands to be on the keyboard and typing code. So um, being able to do that uh, with tools like this is actually quite good. Um, yeah, so that's uh, Tmux. There's uh, another version of Tmux called Teammate, which is kind of nice. We can use this to do remote pairing. So we start a Teammate session. You, you show you a string. In that string, you can pass it to somebody over Skype in Scandinavia or Indonesia or whatever. They can just key in that code, that's the same SSH string. They can log into your session and then you can collaborate on the code. How cool is that? Yeah, because in my company, we are we're pretty big on pair programming. So when we were working on the project with the team in Indonesia, what we did was we, we used Teammate uh, to, to share code. So basically, code is still on my computer. We use, I start a Teammate session, my counterpart in Indonesia logs in to that Teammate session, you see my exact video. And we can do the, the, what I show you, the even windowing and whatever. And the best part is that if you use tools, in, in, uh, if you use Vim, for example, you use Vim as a, a code as an editor, everything is in there. So you can just run tests from your terminal as well. You can run tests in another window and see the result and stuff like that. It's kind of cool. Um, and then you can even do, uh, so what we did to, because you can't just see code, you gotta talk to the guy. So you can start to hang out in the background and you chat with the guy, the other guy, the, the guy on. Voice. <coughs> uh, if you use if you're a Mac user, please, 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 for the love of God, use a window manager. So use something like Size Up or Spectacle or Moon. What I mean is something like this, right? So if I have a window here that I'm gonna like resize this, and I got this guy here, I'm gonna resize that, and like, oh my God, it's gonna be resize hell. Oh, oh shit! Oh, oh, I need this to be full screen. Oh no. Yeah, it's difficult. But if you have a if you have a window manager like Moon, what I have one right, is like I press com control option command space bar and everything is there. Hooray! I need to go on the left. Yeah, you go. Okay, maybe not, maybe not this one. Okay, on the left, on the right, and it's full space. Yes, this is so effective. Right, so I just go and uh, resize, big size, whatever. Please, for the love of God, use the window manager. Windows user had it easy. Windows 8 onwards, you can just drag a window to the left hand corner, pop, it gets stuck to the left. Like it fills up half on the left hand side of the screen. You drag the window to the top, you, you tap to the top, it, it fills up the entire screen. That is so easy on Windows. So Windows users have it easy. Yeah, Mac users, they got like shit, uh, down tools like this. Um, so the three tools you can look at, uh, which I would recommend, and they are mostly free. Size up and spectacle are both free, so download that. There are sh the shortcut keys you can customize them as well. What I've done is I use a tool called Moon, which you have to pay for. But what I like is that Moon, you can customize all, you can customize the shit out of it. I can, you know, whatever shortcut keys I need. Um, there's a very nice tool you're using uh, uh, on a Mac called Auto Jump. 
So for example, all the folders I've been working on, right? So the folders I've been working on, let's see, uh, what was the folder I was working on? It's called Hackathon, I think. Let's type J, hack, and brings me back to the, uh, the folder I was working on. So which is kind of nice. It kind of remembers which folder you've been to. Kind of cool. So if you're working, if you're if you're having a jumping between different folders because your project has has multiple repositories, chances are you're going to jump between different folders very 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 often. So if you use something like auto jump, it makes it really quick to jump between folders. Again, no, it, it will be less movement of the mouse and more of the keyboard. How about that? All right. So we need to start movement. All right. So that's the, for testing. Testing is uh, we use frameworks. Uh, as again, we use PHP unit. Uh, if you're a PHP developer, please use this. There's another new kit on the block called Codeception, Codeception which, also, which is quite, kind of nice. Codeception is a bit more comprehensive than PHP unit. Uh, Codeception actually includes PHP unit inside, right? So it has unit testing in PHP unit. It also has other tools that it helps you do feature testing. So you can actually you know, open up a page, open up a, a headless web browser, check, check, check the web page, and then jump out of it. Right, so testing tools. Uh, there are also other testing tools called that we use. Called, it's called Xdebug. Xdebug is basically a debugger. They can just plug in and find and read and kind of like get variables. What are variables being used? What are the variables being used? What are the, what are the values that are in variables and stuff like that? You use deep, deep, some deep level inspection. Uh, if you're using PHP 5.4 onwards, you can use a project called PHP DBG, which is a project that uh, you know, the, the guys that created PHP supports. Uh, so 5.6 is actually uh, so 5.6 uh, PHP DBG is built in by default, so you can actually use it to do debugging. Uh, other things, that, another group of tools that we use are automation tools. Automation tools basically it, uh, it basically automates a browser. It simulates scripting on the browser and goes through from pages to pages. So these automation tools. Selenium is the big is the oldest boy in the block. Well, well, it's most we use it. It's quite nice. So basically, you write in the DSL pass is Java. It's Java that runs in the background. You pass it some values. PHP unit uh, actually has a plugin you can download. You can see that it will basically run a Selenium test. So the Selenium test, you can tell which browser you want. So you want to run Chrome browser, Firefox browser, Internet Explorer, all that can be done. Right? So basically, it's kind of cool. You can even do it on different machines. So you have, a, you have in your office, you have one guy with a Windows laptop. You have one guy with a Mac. Mac uh, Mac laptop, both of you run the Selenium, expose the port, and just you know, from your machine, just type Selenium run or something, PHP, unit, whatever, and you basically simulate the browser popping up on the other machine. So it's kind of nice. Okay. Uh, you can also use uh, something called Source Lab. Source Lab is like a hosted version of Selenium. So it has API that you can just call and it will basically run the, the run and do screen video capture of how, of, of how you like the browser. Uh, if, you use, if you're doing code work on, on Android, you can also use something called TestDroid or Selendroid, which is kind of similar. Uh, TestDroid actually runs it in all the, all the known Android uh, devices in the world, so it's kind of nice. In the Ruby world, they have this thing called Capybara, which you can also use. So basically what Capybara does is it starts a, a headless web browser. So basically a web kit, if they, uh, for example, that runs in... Uh, a headless web browser means it doesn't show the GUI, it just runs in the background. You just go to pages, tap some things, click some things in the background without opening the browser. So Kevin Pereira can do that. So basically, if I run a headless browser in the background, going to different pages, trying different links to do or whatever stuff you need. So you can use this to do uh, uh, feature testing. Uh, you've written a, a, an awesome shopping cart feature. I need now add things which I want to test uh, at going to a product page, adding the item to the cart, going to the checkout page and making a payment. Right. So this entire flow, you can get some guy, a QA guy, and clicking this browser every day, you can do that, it's not a problem. But you want to simulate it, make, make it less tedious, you can just write a uh, few lines of code, which then do all this for you, which is also which, which makes it more effective. Which means you have one, you can hire one less guy in your team. Okay. <laughs> all right, <coughs> you can also go to modern.io. Modern.io is a is project started by, by Microsoft, so you know, everyone needs to test an ID because. You need to test IE. <laughs> so uh, modern IE has a has a listing of of uh, different brow different virtual machines you can download that has IE all the way down to IE seven IE seven IE IE eight IE nine IE ten 
different operating systems of versions of Windows running those browsers and you use those, spin up a, in VirtualBox and then basically click around and look at the browser and stuff. It's kind of nice. This is what we're actually doing in all our projects right now. We are, we are bounded by contract to, serve to, to support all the way to IE7. So we had to have a bunch of virtual machines that does all this magic. So yeah. So Modern IE is a very nice place, a page that has all these all these resources in, together. We even you can even run there's even a uh, if, if I'm not wrong, there's actually a, a, a like a, a part of the site where you just key in your website URL, go there, and then uh, you basically you basically check the page and say what you need we suggest to you what you need to do to make it to make your website support different versions of IE. It's kind of nice. Deployment tool. So you've written all your code, you've tested all your code, and now the, 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 you have to put your code into the World Wide Web because everyone needs to look at your code, right? So how do you do this? So one way we do this is use, uh, you can, you know, in the good old fashioned way is open up an FTP client and just uh, FTP all the files up, which is fine. You still do that, it's fine, you know. But most people nowadays, cool kids, uh, we, we use uh, automation tools like this. Uh, so uh, we call this continuous integration. So basically, do, we do continuous integration. Basically, well, it's kind of like whenever we check in the code, um, the code runs through, uh, runs through a process of testing. It gets tested on, in an automated fashion. So you don't have to keep testing the code. Because if you have a team, everyone checking in code at the same time, you can't be checking everyone's code at the same time. So what, uh, testing everyone's code at the same time. So you have an automated way of, of running the test on the entire code base and then once it's done you can run an additional additional line of code that basically does push the production. We call that continuous deployment. So the moment someone in your team checks in code, it appears in production. How cool is that? Uh, this is actually very good uh, this is kind of like a good way to, to be effective in hackathon. If you're doing a hackathon like this, you are very tired. You can get very tired in the middle of the night and you don't want to make mistakes in doing trivial things like this, pushing the production. So what we, what we do in, in the previous hackathon I attended, I actually did a git, git hook. So on GitHub, you basically tr uh, trigger a, a build on my Jenkins server, which will then do a pool on my production machine, which git pool on the production machine. So once I pass the test, you do git pool, and immediately I see it on my production machine. So all this is, is done in an automated fashion. So it's in a team, you are working in a very new team, Make it a goal to get this, all these things done from day one. The reason is, so the faster you can get this done, the more you can, the faster you can get focus on writing code. Because you want to build write code and have the business owner look at the code as soon as possible. So write code, get commit, boom, 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 boom. Oh, it's already on production. Then, or rather, the staging area where your business owners can inspect and check. So this is very cool. So you can check out Jenkins. You can check out Cruise Control. Uh, it's an open source version called Travis CI. If you have a GitHub repository, chances are you can already hook it up with Travis CI. And if you have, uh, you have like a uh, PHP unit test suite already built into your, as part of your, your Git repository or part of your code, you basically run the test for you. Very cool. Uh, deploying, you uh, you will probably have to put this on some place on the World Wide Web. So chances are you want to put it in place. You know, we heard from SoftLayer previously, you know, they're nice. Um, and there's Amazon Web Service, there's Heroku. Uh, Heroku now supports PHP, which is kind of, kind of nice. Uh, Windows Azure. Windows Azure surprisingly supports PHP because they have Linux servers uh, that you can spin up. Uh, Heroku and, uh, and Windows Azure have this, and App Fork, for example, they have, uh, they have this thing called Platform and Service. Yeah, so basically what you do is git push, and, you, and that, you, that service would have all the all the server uh, all, all, all the tools that you need there. MySQL server will be there, there'll be web the Apache web server will be provisioned for you and all that stuff. You have to go in and install everything so it's kind of nice. App engine as well you can do that. <coughs> the other tools you can find online usually I if I'm writing I'm writing a lot of JSON. Right? I'm writing, I want to make sure my JSON data is formatted properly. So I use the tool called uh, JSON viewer, so I can, I can just copy and paste the JSON uh, code here. You format it nicely. Uh, you can even in a table form and stuff. Which kind of nice. If you're writing code, uh, I would recommend you try Nitrous.io. Nitrous.io is basically a uh, web-based IDE. So 
So basically, you, you will spin up a, a, a Linux server which has either Ruby or PHP built in. You can then write your code in a web based uh, text editor, which you can then uh, deploy and then test on uh, immediately. It's kind of nice, it's everything in one. Um, it's free uh, up to a certain point. And you can co do online collaboration on uh, Nitrous IO. You can actually invite your friends or co workers to log in. Make a and, and collaborate on the, on the code. It's kind of like Google Docs but for writing code. It's kind of cool, right? Yeah, so it's kind of cool. Uh, Pivotal Tracker. So if you're doing project management, I would recommend you check out Pivotal Tracker because Pivotal Tracker is kind of project, yeah, project management. Tier Trello is a nice tool to check out. So there's another other online tools you can ask. Yeah. Yeah. Quick question as yeah. far as uh, JSON viewing. Is there any uh, online system where you could put in the JSON output and it'll tell you the array? Basically, the PHP code to, to pull it into an array. Because huh. that would save like a lot of time. I'm not, I've not seen that. Okay. Tried yet, but yeah. But, no. Good to find out. Anyway, so, uh, more readings. If you're really interested in pursuing a career as a developer or manager or hiring people who do PHP work, uh, you can check out these websites. PHP the right way. Yeah, of course, PHP has a kind of a bad reputation of people writing code in a very bad fashion. So, um, PHP the right way is kind of a, a list of all the best practices, right? So we try to weed out all the bad hats, and, and, and you know, yeah, just generally want to be nice guys. Yeah. So check this out. Uh, and there's another a, a bunch of guys that has come up with a thing called the framework of interrupt group. So there are different types of PHP frameworks out there. So they, they feel that they need to have a way to where they can, where somebody who has written a brilliant piece of code and share it on Cake PHP or Laravel and all these other guys. So the guys who came, came here to form a group, a working group, uh, we call it a, a, a PHP framework interrupt group. So uh, Laravel and Cake PHP are both on, uh, the creators behind them are uh, uh, contributors behind those projects are actually part of this group. So yeah, also the guys who came out with the composer, the package manager, which is kind of nice. One book you should read is Clean Code. I think it's a very good book to read uh, as a for any developer because it helps you. It's, it, it, the code examples there are in Java, but it gives you very good, um, a basic introduction to how to write code in Ruby. It's kind of a disclaimer, but it's, it's not easy to write code in Ruby. <laughs> but how you name variables, how what level of abstraction you should have, uh, where does comments matter in your code. Where how we should structure your code, uh, different levels of extraction and all this stuff. This is a very good book. I recommend any develop any developer who wants to be good at your craft to read this book. Um, somebody has put together a list of all the awesome awesome source uh, PHP projects, so you can check them out. Uh, my project PHPQ is actually on it. Uh, a couple of Singaporean uh, uh, projects are also on this. Uh, Wrestler. OP off and a few other guys, uh, uh, their projects are listed here as well. So if you need, yeah, this is a good resource to turn to. It is nicely categorized into different types of categories of software. So you can use this as a way, as a resource to find uh, tools that you need. And actually that's all I have. Um, any other questions? I actually took up one hour, oh my god, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you've been entertained and I hope, uh, hope you've been fall asleep too much. Uh, if you have any questions, you can find me on, uh, I hope I can find this slide. There. You can find me over here. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, just tweet me or, um, yeah, just, there are ways to get to me. I'll be around pretty much to, for a few more hours here. So if you want to ask me something, you just come back. Okay. Um, oh yes, the slide. Uh, the slides are available here. So j .m j .m p slash php agile toolbox. So this is actually the, an extended version of the of the of, the, of the another presentation I did. With you, so so uh, updated and check the fact check. Yeah. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much.